Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bernina Gathering Tips and Techniques webinar. We're so glad you're with us today. We uh, will have questions at the end. Oh, I'm Julie Bridgman. I will be your host for this webinar. And I want to let you know that we will have our, I'll save the questions for the end. So throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, you can go to the questions pane, which is in your control panel and type in your questions and I will receive those and save them for Jeannie for the end of the presentation. Our presenter today is Jeannie Delpit. She's been with Bernina for 24 years and her current title is Manager of National Events. Jeannie has been sewing for most of her life and especially loves to, is a garment sewer. Welcome Jeannie. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who is logging on today to give part of your day. So I'm, as I mentioned, as Julie shared, I'm a garment sewist for most of my life. Do like to dabble in quilting, some home deck, etc. But Julie, why not? Let's just get started. So thanks to all of you for joining me today. That's I scroll through my next slide. So as we talk about gathering tips and techniques, we find out what actually is gathering. Gathering basically by our friends at Webster's say that it is you know, a means, I guess just as typical gathering. It's an assembly or a meeting, the collection of food or raw materials, Co collection or a compilation, of course, gathering cloth. So Webster just didn't quite understand that there were those of us who like to do a little bit more of gathering. And so our friends at Colette Media expounded upon that so as you see and thank you to our friends there a simple explanation gather stitches are used to sew a longer piece to a shorter piece thus resulting in significant fullness so you use a long row of basting stitches they say three sometimes you use two and then you gather these threads up to collect actually my favorite kind of gathering is with good friends over at my most favorite libation, but that's not going to happen for a while. So until that does happen, we'll go collect our gathered thoughts on our virtual presentation and share some fun things for the day. So there are so many ways to achieve gathered results. Now it's not an old, it is an old technique. It's been around for many, many years. So I just want to share with you some of the ways that I kind of like to do gathering and basically just some of the techniques. Now, there's not a handout for today's session. The presentation will be recorded and put up on YouTube. So if you wanna go back, you're always welcome to feel free and reach out to me. But favorite feet, just some basic, basic things to always consider. What type of foot do you want to use? How does the thread and the tension and the stitch length, how do those all work together to achieve the results that you wish? What about the weight of the fabric? Naturally, heavier weight fabrics are going to gather less, but you can still achieve a good gather than a lightweight fabric will. Now, I do use a polyester thread when I'm running my gathering stitches. It's a little heavier, and it will maintain, as you pull those gather stitches together, a little bit more strength. So, a lot of feet to use. I even threw in there an overlocker foot. Little friend right down here, our overlocker gathering foot. But depending upon what machine model, and I'm referring to Bernina today, but any machine does gather because most of our machines out there in the market have a basting stitch, a length of five or a length of six, the longest stitch you can find to progress down the seam edge of your fabric. But good old pressure foot number one, our standard foot right here on the left hand side, we do have a coded as well as a dual feed system. We have a wonderful foot number 34. This happens to be one of my favorites. I love the visibility of the clear reverse pattern foot number 34, 34C, 34D, because I use a nine millimeter machine are two of my favorite go-to feet. Oh uh, gosh, a technique that I'll share actually incorporates the number three buttonhole foot, the non-automatic buttonhole foot. And then last but not least, there are two gathering feet, the gathering foot for your sewing machine, as well as a gathering foot for your overlocker. So quite a few feet. And if you don't have one of these feet, just a good standard natural, just a basic functional foot is 
all the two need to gather. Now, we talked about thread tension and stitch length. When you think about how the thread flows down the path of the fabric, and you wonder, why am I getting puckers? Well, it could be that your needle tension is too tight. Hmm. Could needle tension actually have something to do with the actual stitch length? It does, it actually does. The higher the tension on your needle, the less thread can travel. So it tends to go very short distances, enhancing the amount of gathering. The stitch length definitely plays a part in this. The longer the stitch length, the more fabric will be transferred under the presser foot. Thus, you'll have longer stitches and easier to gather up. I shoot for the longest stitch length whenever I'm gathering. I can always cut back, but the more fabric I can gather in one pass, the better it is. And as I mentioned, there's nothing worse than having the thread go pop right in the middle of a gather. So you're kind of keeping that in mind. Don't push your machine, let it do its natural course, but definitely play with your thread tension and your stitch length. Now, there are ways to watch this. Whenever I do my cuts, I am a test fiend. I like to test before I apply the actual application to the finished result. Now, some of you are, oh my gosh, absolutely everything. I don't care what it turns out to be. I just want to gather and go for it. That's great, as long as you have no preconceived notion or no expectations of what the amount of gathering should be. But I still, I like to mark my fabrics at good six inch lengths. I can do a 12 inch, I can do an 18 inch, but in my mind, I've got six inch intervals at which I can stop and change the setup of my machine and then go back and see how those changes modified the results I wished to achieve. Now, here we talked about lightweight fabrics versus heavyweight fabrics. The top layer is a beautiful silk shantung. The medium layer is a quilting cotton and the bottom is a muslin. So you definitely see, I did use the number 16 foot, the gathering foot number 16 for this. And I increased my needle tension as I went down the path. You can see how slight gathers and definitely increased when I got to the end. And here in a medium weight fabric, not so much, but definitely picked up the speed of gathering and gracious in this heavy weight muslin, much heavier weight than the medium weight cotton or the silk, did not have near as many gathers. So perhaps the number 16 foot would not be the best to suit for the heavier weight fabric, I would probably want to go with layers of stitching to pull them together. But definitely the fabric weight can have an altering on the effect of your gathers. So just out of curiosity, Julie, I'd love to see in our little poll, what type of sewing do our watchers or our, our attendees enjoy doing most? So here we go. You actually have a couple choices. I believe it's fashion and garments, quilting, home deck and crafts, and recycling and upcycling. I know where I am, but just kind of curious to see where our attendees' passions fall. I know I'm definitely a garment sewist, but I do dabble a little bit into home deck, and I'm trying quilting. I've had many friends who tell me, it's not scary, just go for it. So Julie, what do you see? Yes. Okay, uh, well, the majority at about 50, almost 50% is quilting. Wow, Next, okay. around 30% is garment and fashion. Okay. Around 20% is home decor and crafts, and 1% recycling, upcycling. All right, well, that's cool. We all like to start things from scratch. We all like to make them our own. But at the same time, there could be something that says, oh, I'm going to turn that into something new. And a gather just might be the right attribute to use. Now, gathering does adapt to everyone. You know, we, we talk about heirloom. We talk about quilting. And as you see, there are some puffing strips in these lovely little quilts, probably more so to the younger quilt age, of the younger age of the quilt recipients, but adorable little baby quilts. So definitely puffing place itself into some quilting techniques. And sometimes you may gather the outer ruffle around the edge of your quilt. Now we see some beautiful rows of gathering on this home deck pillow. 
I love making my own bed skirts. You might think I'm crazy, but it's pretty much mindless. You just get a top sheet and then you add whatever you wish to go around and quick and easy ways to achieve this quick, easy results too. And beautiful heirloom pillows with the gathers, the puffing, and then back to garments. So a little home deck, a little quilting, a little bit of heirloom sewing. So definitely gathering can adapt itself to any type of sewing genre. Now, basics on a theme, just good old variations. We basically know how easy it is to run two rows of gathering stitches. Here, I'm doing them within the seam allowance. I've got two rows of stitches within the seam allowance. I love my guide over here on the right-hand side of my foot because I like to have my gathering rows as consistent in width apart as possible. I just find that if you take a little bit of time and you achieve the pre-work as good as it can be, then the final results will be a little nicer. You can go through this willy-nilly and have your gathering stitches go apart and back together. It's just not going to be as pretty as if it were just to take your time. So two beautiful long rows of gathering stitches. When I do my gathering, I like these longer pins. And I will pin at the top, in the middle, and on the opposite side. So you actually see three places for my fabric that's being gathered to be secured to my base fabric. One other thing I like to do is you'll notice right up here, as I start my second row, I get to my beginning area to be gathered. I stop and I lock my stitch. This prevents the rest of this from being pulled out when you start gathering from the right-hand side. Now, this is how I do it. I'm sure there are many ways that folks out there do it themselves, but this is just my little tip. So when I stitch up to this point right here, I would lock my stitch, therefore I can gather and they won't come out into my seam allowance. So beautiful, two nice long rows. Well, you notice I did not do three rows of gathering stitches. And that's because I learned this trick from my friends at Martha Poland School of Heirloom, Heirloom Stitching many, many years ago. I don't want to do three rows of gathering stitches because it's a very delicate fabric. I don't want that third row of stitching to show needle holes in my fine fabric. So I use a sticky note. I put my needle into position and then I let the edge of my sticky note, the sticky part is right here. It's actually holding those gathers in place as it feeds under my foot. When I get to the end of sticky note number one and begin into sticky note number two, I'll then bring sticky note number one back around to the bottom. So I'm always using the same two sticky notes just to progress down that side. And what's nice is your, your gathers tend to lay a little bit smoother, a little bit nicer, and you don't have that third row of stitching that could show needle holes on your fine batiste or silk fabric. So a cool little stick, a cool little trick rather, I say I definitely give credit where credit due, our friends at the Martha Pullen School of Heirloom Sewing. Now, do you hover? I've heard so many people say, I don't like to hover. It just gets me, gets me. Well, a very dear friend of mine, and I used to disagree on whether needle stayed up or needle stayed down on your screen. I used to be a needle down person where I liked the needle to go down and then I could raise a foot on my own. Well, with hover, so many times, I don't want the machine to hover when I don't want it to. So I'll still go ahead and engage the hover function in my Bernina. And that's basically by going into your setup, selecting your stitches. Then this function or this icon right here means the head frame of my machine, the functions that pertain to the head frame, which are all these down here. Do you see your breadcrumbs, settings, stitches, and then this beautiful icon that says, take me into my needle down functionality. So here's the breadcrumb with which you want to follow. So this does pertain to needle down function. I did go ahead and engage my middle, my mid high hover. Now, once I do that, that's all great because when the needle stops in my fabric, the foot will slightly raise. But I don't activate needle down on my screen. I always leave it up. That way, if you use the kick back on your foot control to roll your heel back, the needle will sink given that you've set it up in your setup 
to have that as your preferred function. So when I roll back on my heel, boom, the needle goes in the fabric. It's flat with needle up, needle down, it hovers. It hovers at my control. So as I'm sewing along, and I do sew in two pins, not over, but up two pins, I found out that when I had needle stop down engaged, it took that one more stitch and I held my breath hoping that it would not hit that pin. Now it stops up, I remove that pin, kick back, needle stop down, lifts, I adjust and on I go. I just have a bit more control when I activate the hover as per my own preferences. So perhaps you might wanna try that, just a unique, unique option. Now, here we go, back to variations on the theme, two rows of stitching again, stitch length of basting as long as you can. I am choosing this time to go outside and inside my five eighths inch seam allowance. Well, why would you suggest to do this? It's easier to move the basting stitches in one case, and you'll notice I typically, if not always, put my gathered edge or my gathered side down next to my feed teeth, feed dog. So it's helping to grip and pull that fabric underneath and also helps that feed dog to lift and pull back. But here I have a nice outer row of stitching and I can kind of adjust my gathers. And then boom, it is so easy to remove those gathering stitches. Sometimes you might get them caught up in your seam line, but just one more variation of the theme. Now, this time we did do three rows and the three rows were, my gracious sakes, two of them were within the seam allowance and the third was outside the seam allowance. So three beautiful rows of stitching, definitely a bit more time involved, but there is so much more control. These little gathers were perfectly placed exactly where I wanted. Now this is a very tight gather. So imagine in fabric that's a bit more loosely gathered, this third row of stitching helps to hold those gathers in place a bit more and it's not hard to take out. Just remember your bob and thread is a little looser, it's easier to remove. So work your bob and thread to draw your gathers as well as to use that thread to remove the actual gathering thread. So now we've talked about the basic ways of doing two thread rows and three thread rows. That's with just basically a straight stitch. We have a gathering stitch in our Bernina and it's stitch number 12. Good old stitch number 12. Now I found that a little dental floss kind of helped with this trick and foot number three or three C because as you see foot number three, three C has two wonderful grooves right under the sole. So I stripped off enough, um, excuse me, enough dental floss that I thought I would need and in some cases, if you're going to do a dust ruffle, get two containers of dental floss. It's just a smart idea, even though it all draws up very nicely. It's nice because you have a lot of fabric that you want to stitch and gather up for your dust ruffle. So the two sides, I actually bring them together, tie a knot. Now that little screw that you might sometimes find in the bottom of your presser foot bag or your presser foot box, it just belongs right on the back of your presser foot as a positioning and a holding mechanism for the quilting guy that goes into the hole. But it also acts as a perfect place to tie the knot and hang your dental floss across the back of your foot. I did alter my stitch length and stitch width to be as wide as I possibly could be and to shorten it a little bit. So I went down to a one. I did drop my feed dog. So I sew in place and now I have a very good tight start of my stitch and just start stitching. I stitched right within the 5 8 inch seam allowance. So that 5 8 inch seam allowance is right on this left hand edge. And as you see, it forms a very unique double row over top of your dental floss or your cord or whatever you find is smooth and easy to draw through. And then we go back to our wonderful standard foot to join the flat piece to the gathers. So you sort of see, it looks like it's a bit of a hubbub, Actually, when you lay your fabric piece to be gathered right down on top, these gathers may just as nice as they can be. And once again, a beautiful result for your gathers once you apply your ruched piece to your flat piece. So a gathering stitch is also a great option as well. 
Now we have a gathering foot. As I mentioned earlier, I did use the number 16 slash 16 C when I was testing those weights of fabrics because that is a great way to just put the foot underneath there and off you go. Now, the foot number 16, you can gather a piece of fabric by itself or you can actually gather and attach it to the flat piece. But the key is to know where the fabrics lie when you do use this foot. So the bottom layer right here, this is going to be gathered as you sew. The feed tog, feed teeth are just underneath the foot. It feels like it's a little bit loose, but it's not. But it does need to have a little control when you move the fabric through. So this goes underneath. You kind of see a little bit of a, of a slot right here in between the bottom and the, the top level of the foot. It's a small slot in there. So that's where your top layer, the layer that's not going to be gathered, that's your constant, will be placed into that slot. You see how I kind of folded the fabric back a little bit so you see the under piece to be gathered and the top layer to stay straight. Now here's where that hand coordination comes into play because you know, you're going to have already tested to see just how much tension you want on that thread to see how many gathers you wish. But as you're sewing along, your right hand is going to gently stay that constant into the fold of the foot. Your left hand will gently hold the piece under to be gathered. You try to keep them coordinated together so that they both, in the picture here, have the seam allowance on the edge in alignment. If it comes out a little bit, sew your favorite tool, your seam ripper can go back and adjust, but no, just sew slowly. Take your time, especially when using this, and practice. It took me a good run or two or three to really get a balance of how I held my right hand and my left hand to feed the fabrics together. So, a beautiful, and as you see, one pass. One pass is all it takes to have a beautiful result. Now, with that fun little gathering foot, you can do some clever little things. And, and I just decided to put together a little ruffle rug just as a quick little inspiration here. So I cut bias strips. These were cut three inches of three inches wide. You can go narrower, you can go wider. You know, a little bit narrower always adapts for a smaller raise on your small um, ruffle quilt or ruffle ruffled rug. So I did reinforce my denim and I used a fusible stabilizer, but ticking fabric, because it's got great lines already on it, is a super, super base fabric. It's strong, it's durable, the lines are already there, but if you don't have a fabric that has markings on it, then just draw your markings. I did these one inch apart. Then I took my fabric bias strips and just began feeding them right underneath the center of my foot. And I gathered and I gathered and I gathered and I gathered. And when I came to a place that had an intended, I just slipped my one piece to start underneath my piece that was already gathered and let them connect. I kind of like the little white look for the selvage edge. So lots of gathers, quite not enough to complete here, but I could cut some more, but lots of rows of gathers as you see just the little tail of the selvage. So I started on my first line. I did put my lovely number 34 C foot, 34 C foot back on, and I changed to a zigzag. I wanted a little bit more control, not so it took off so quickly and sewed down the path with me, but just so I had a little bit more of a sturdy base. So I attached my ruffle to my base with a zigzag, stitch width of one, stitch length of one, just to tightly go right down the center. And as you see, I would lift and position and then sew right down the middle. Now, a few more rows would have completed this, but how fun. You adjust the height of your strips, the amount of gather in the back, and it's just a lot of fun. Okay, now, you gather with an overlock. Oh my gracious sakes, I mentioned earlier that the overlock has the opportunity to gather for you as well. So many, if not every single overlock that comes on the market these days has a differential feed. The differential is two feed dogs and they work simultaneous or they work where one feeds faster or the one feeds slower. So they're actually stretching your fabric as it goes under the foot or they're gathering it together as you adjust the differential. 
So I always set my machine up, my overlocker up for four threaded balance stitch. And that means upper looper, lower looper, meet on the edge, left needle, right needle, exactly as it should be. I've done that here for you. We're looking at the color coding. The blue thread is the upper needle. The red is the lower, excuse me, upper looper, pardon, upper looper. The red is the lower looper. And of course, my yellow and green are my needle threads. The differential is loaded right, located right here on the side of the machine, the differential. And above that is your stitch length. These do play a part in the amount of gathering once again. So I just use the regular standard foot. And of course, I do this with all of my testing. I cut my strips, I measure at certain intervals down that piece of fabric, and then using the standard foot, I'm only going to test my gathering with the settings of the machine. So I use my differential, and that means the front V-dog is constant. The back one's moving twice as fast. Excuse me, the front V-dog is your, the back V-dog is your constant. Yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Back V-dog is your constant. The front one's moving twice as fast, or not as quickly. So the twice as fast pushes the gathers into the constant of the dog and you thus get gathers. My way to remember this is to gather, together we go. So you go to a differential of two or higher and you're gathering together. So here, a normal stitch length at 2.5. And then the next is a beautiful stitch length at one. I went a little lower, so a few more gathers because Fewer needle threads or less needle thread causes the fabric to gather naturally. It can't reach the distance you wish it to go. Then we went back to a very long stitch length with a gap with the differential two, and it moved faster, but not that many more gathers. Now I increased my needle tension. Remember, we're using a standard foot, not the gathering foot. So I increased my needle tension to seven. My stitch length still at four differential at two, a few more gathers, but you can definitely see how when I crank that needle tension up, giving the needle thread the minimum amount to travel, it helped enhance the gathers as well. So if you don't have the gathering foot, then the standard foot can do what, you know, do some basic techniques. If you've got the gathering foot, you are cooking with gas. This gathering foot does only come right now with the L4 series. But L450 to L460. For our new L8 series, when those machines are fully in the line, you'll see accessory feet for those as well. But this wonderful gathering foot, this I call the flexible pressure finger. This can kind of lift and lower. This right here is what rests on the feed dog. So it has a little bit of play. You lift it up or lift your foot so you get that bottom layer fed in. And as you see, it goes right next to it, and those gathers take place right off the bat. So starting out again with the gathering foot, oh my gracious sakes, we truly see an enhanced amount of gathers when you use the actual gathering foot. Now, at this stitch length of, excuse me, a needle tension of nine, it, it couldn't be prettier. I loved it, loved it, loved it. But I realized I could actually go back to a more relaxed amount of gathers and still achieve the results I wanted to do. Because I want to attach a second layer as I'm gathering. So you know where your test run is suitable, you like the way it is, and you're going to feed that fabric right back into the foot as you normally would. You wanna take a few stitches until the needles are in the fabric. Then lift the presser foot. Then as you see, I've cut a little notch right into the upper right hand corner of my base fabric to slip on top of my gathers. That's so that when I lift the foot with needles down in, I can slide my second piece of fabric in between this little area right here under the top of the foot and above the presser, kind of your presser finger adjustment and the blade is in the way. So I want to make sure that's cut away so my needle threads can take the next stitch or two right into that top layer. Hand walk the first several stitches. If you don't, I'm just going to encourage that you hand walk the first several stitches. Then stitch slowly. That's the key again. You'll notice that the lower layer right here is just a bit to the right. 
And the upper layer, this is my gathered layer. This is my flat or slash constant layer. I want them to be in line with each other. So back to your hands, kind of coordination to keep your hands feeding the fabrics together as you do. So beautiful results. And I love that clean, elegant finish on the inside. Can you use it for other things? Absolutely. Puffing strips. You can use it for gathers on your t-shirts. T-shirts and overlockers love each other. They're a relationship made in heaven. So gathering can be quick, easy, finish off with your overlocker, as well as your sewing machine in many, many ways. But if you set your gathers on one side and the other, they're always balanced and always perfect. That overlocker just does the hard work for you. Now, we talk about gathers, we talk about ease. So as you read the definition, ease is just gently joining a larger piece to fit into a smaller. We're not gathering. There's such a small amount of difference in one length to the other that ease is just a natural way to go. You ease something in, a bit of fit in the ease sleeve, sleeve cap is eased into the armhole. And we thank Judith Christensen in her glossary of sewing terms for this lovely definition. So ease, I'm going to kind of give you an example of both. As a garment sewist, I found that this was important so that your, your garments look professional. So here I have a sleeve cap with a little bit of ease, and I defined one with some soft gathers. You'll notice that in the sleeve cap with my gathers, I'm running two rows of gathering stitches side by side right there at that seam allowance. For my ease, I'm using the number 16 foot, so it naturally eases and keeps that top layer a little bit more form. I have a trick to show you in a moment. So, good old two rows of gathering stitches. We have it nicely and beautifully gathered up, pinned like crazy, stitched like crazy, and then boom, you see the soft gathers in the top of the sleeve cap. And that's what we want to see. We want to see some soft gathers. And typically, they start between your notches. But you can adjust the gathers softly all the way across or adjust them so they are where you want your gathers to be, which is typically at the top of the sleeve cap. Now, for the ease, this number 16 foot allowed it to gently kind of gather, bend, I should say. You see how it slightly curves, does not create gathers but it slightly shapes that little seam allowance at the top. So once you stitch the sleeve cap to the garment itself, it provides that soft little ease place and how smoothly it just fits right into that sleeve cap. Now, let me share a little video with you on how I actually have another way to do some easing into a sleeve cap. If you notice that my finger is putting resistance behind the presser foot, I'm doing this on purpose because it's acting as the number 16 foot where it does not want the thread to travel. So once I cut the thread, you'll see that natural soft ease worked in and those, once we pull that basting thread out, they're gone. Okay. So let's go back to our presentation and make sure that we are there. Okay. Oop. All right. So hope that worked for everybody. As I say, just a little bit of showing how I did the ease in the sleeve cap. Put my finger behind there. Just one more option. I've used this many, many times when I didn't want to do two a huge row of E stitches, but it seems to work pretty well. So without further ado on that note, gathering, as I said, does adapt to every type of sewing genre. 
we hope that whatever you do, you're not afraid of gathering because it can add softness, it can add a spark, it can add a flare, it can add a little bit of, of, of whimsy where you think it might be necessary. It also can cover a multitude of sins when we want to just gently drape a body or, or create something to sort of configure and hide some of those little goodies underneath. But I did go to the wonderful World Wide Web and I just took a little bit of inspiration. I gathered some together for us. So as you see, I've given credit to the designers for their different products, but Hugh gathered trousers different layers where how quick and easy you could just set up your overlock or your number 16 foot. This is a beautiful gathered bodice where the pieces are stayed together. There is a lining underneath here so the gathers do lay flat. Love again just layers of gathers for soft softness. Here we talk about fabric. This wonderful silk satin is a heavier fabric. It's going to provide gathers that are a bit more voluminous, a little richer in the way that they fall. And again, a small strip in between, two layers of gathers, and according to gather it up around the waist. And last but not least, just a few more. You might think that these are gathered. This is kind of an illusion. These are actually done in a circle, and the gathers are because the way the fabric falls gives that beautiful flounce. But the bodice and the skirt, the skirt was beautifully gathered to the bodice and talk about a little bit of fun and detail. Oh my gracious sakes. And as you see, easy gathers at the waistline to let you enjoy that lunch with your girlfriends. So without further ado, I believe that brings us to the end. Julie, were there any questions that our attendees had for the day? Yes, thank you, Jeannie. We All have right. a few questions that came in. The first one, to uh, is when you're making, doing a gather that is with the technique where it, the gather's fixed. It's not like say with the ruffler foot number 86. Mm -hmm. How do you have a good way to measure how much you need for a fixed panel? That once again is that testing. I would take the piece of fabric, you know, your, your stay, your constant, and you know how much that's going to be, say 18 inches. I'm going to suggest that you get two or three additional pieces of fabric and you test them to see which one most closely fits that 18 inch constant. With a ruffler foot, you can adjust the amount of ruffles every one stitch, every six stitches, I think every 12. And again, you can change the stitch length too. There's a little screw on the front that you can adjust so it pulls and makes a larger tuck, a larger gather or a smaller one. So my key is just to test, unless you can just whack off the extra, it does not matter, but you don't always know that relationship, that ratio of what's to be gathered into that constant piece. So I'm mm -hmm. a firm believer in testing for the best results. Okay, great. What is the white guide that you are using on the machine? That comes in the majority of the machine boxes. And if not, that is your seam guide and it clips right to the side of the arm, or the, right to the side of the table. You can move it to the left, you can move it to the right. It's the exact height as the presser foot raised, so there's nothing to impede as you go from right side to left side. If that is not in your machine box, add it to your wish list. It's a perfect stocking stuffer. Great. Do you sew with the gathered fabric on the bottom? I do. That is my, that's just my natural course. Um, there would be, there's always an exception to the rule. There could be the need for me to turn it over so I watch, but for the most part, 95 to 98% of the time, I've let that feed dog just work it for me because it reaches out in front and pulls the gather all the way to the needle. Whereas when it's on the top, the presser foot can sometimes push that gather away. But with the Bernina and that box feed system, down come my feed dogs, move forward with the whole gathered edge together. Okay, great. With the serger, can you still, when you're gathering, can you still pull the threads to make it tighter? 
Oh, great question. You absolutely can. And that's when, if I were doing something to be gathered on my overlocker, I would change the color of my needle threads on purpose because they're mm -hmm. easy to identify. And those needle threads, oh my gracious sakes, you just can pull, pull, pull those needle threads. And there again, you might want to use a little stronger thread like a polyester because as you start to gather, I love my cotton threads. I do love my silk threads. Those are very strong as well. But a polyester just seems to have given me the best results over time. But that overlocker, those two needle threads, pull those as tight as you wish. Don't cut them. How do I know that? You find that you <laughs> at ease and there goes, oops, there goes those threads. I should not have cut quite so short. But you know, anytime, we have to gather our wits about us when we do something wrong. That's always a learning experience. Yes, that's how we learn. <laughs> um, can you go over that sticky note, the trick with the oh, sticky note? Again? Sure. May I just run back through to those slides? If you give me a second. <laughs> ba -ba -ba -boom, ba -ba -boom. As I mentioned, our friends at Martha Poland, oh my gracious sakes, this was the coolest little tip. As you see, I have entered the needle position right there in my seam line. And that's where I have chosen for my left hand thread to fall in my two rows of gathers. But I will take that sticky edge of sticky note number one, lift my foot up and put it right there so that sticky edge rests right next to my stitching line. Now that's, I'll press down and that kind of helps to keep, this is where I'm going to have my gathers on the top side as opposed to down below. So here's one time when I would. So I lay that sticky note down, but as you see, I'm using that sticky note to hold my gathers in place, the sticky part of it. When I get to the end of number one, right down here, actually number two, I would take number one, bring it down and lay it right on top of number two. So I continue on letting the left hand sole of my foot as I'm looking at it, rest right on that sticky paper. So, I mean, the sticky note's facing down, so there's no resistance. It just smoothly glides right on the top, and you're not worried about that extra third row stitching on those finer fabrics. I hope that helped. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what is that beautiful quilt behind you? Oh, that piece, hmm, I'm telling myself, we have some remarkable Bernina ambassadors and quite a few of them have done some things for Bernina over the years. And the piece behind me is a piece done by Carol Breyer Ballard Gentry. And it's 30 years old, believe it or not, but it's a piece that she did for Bernina and it was hot, hanging in the home office. And when we had a redecoration and sort of a re layout of how the office rooms went, this piece was up for adoption. And I adopted it. So wow, it lucky say, you. It, it's, I'm very blessed, very, very blessed to have such an exquisite piece hanging behind me. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Does the amount of gathering differ if you're using the cross cut or a straight of grain? Well, <laughs> I will find that no, it really does not. It really does not. But the amount of gathering is going to be more dependent upon the tension of the threads, the length of your stitch, how far you want. You can always get something to gather a little bit more as long as there's fabric to be drawn up. So I like the bias when I run that stitch down because the threads don't ravel on a bias strip. So that's why I chose the bias for that little wonderful pillow that you saw. The threads on a bias strip don't ravel, but basically the amount of gathering should pretty much be the same. But as I mentioned, using those threads to gather up. If there's fabric left to be gathered, it can still have a little bit more to squeeze into a small area. Okay. I recently made a blouse. I had to gather the neckline and I used the 34 D foot. I used the basting stitch, but ran into difficulty keeping the stitches gathered evenly. I tried pulling the thread, but it made it worse. Any suggestions? Hmm. When you're gathering around a neckline, and I'm thinking it could be a, a, a circle, 
you might, and this is gonna sound crazy, just to keep it from shifting on you, lay a piece of tissue, very, very lightweight tissue underneath your fabric. If it's a lightweight, one layer to be gathered, and I would suggest two rows of gathering stitches. Now, the one on the outside is gonna be longer when you look at the one on the inner curve, just because of the nature of the beast. Just because as you travel, the same distance inside a circle, outside a circle, you're gonna go further. So that piece of tissue can act as a support. Then just start gently gathering and removing the tissue right before you gather. And that should help to support that a little bit, you know, not being right there with you to see in person what you're dealing with is sort of hard to imagine, but I'm thinking that might be a suggestion and just let that extra layer of tissue off of the support around the neckline. Again, if you had the spritz to remove it, that would be okay too, because tissue sort of dissipates, but you know, see if that doesn't help. And again, gently, gently gather. Mm -hmm. You have to start from center neck and gather back one way, center and gather back one way. That's an option too. Just don't give up. Okay. Do you prefer to sew the sleeve seam before setting it in the garment or insert the sleeve piece while flat? It, I think it depends upon the nature of the pattern. I mm -hmm. personally pretend, prefer to set the sleeve in once the side seam is sewn up. That's just how I find it to be a nice crisp. However, there are some patterns that allow me to really easily, the one that I showed you in the sample, I set the sleeve in. And then I mm -hmm. sewed the underarm and down the side. Um, I'd say 75% of the time, I would go to stitching the side seam for both the garment and the sleeve and inserting them that way. It just gives me the complete finish. And the seam allowance stands a little stronger and taller on the inside. Okay. Do you have any tips for sharing? For sharing. Oh, my gracious. <sighs> Something oh. kind of fun. There is a number six foot. It has a small hole in the very front of it. To me, sheer almost as if you have a little bit of elastication in the middle. They do sell elastic threads, believe it or not, you can wear some elastic thread. So I would consider marking the fabric that is to be sheared with the distance of the shearing, turning right side down next to feed dog and threading elastic into the hole of the number six foot and then just let it zigzag over the top don't pull it yet don't pull it yet you'll know, kind of give yourself a little bit of just a little more relaxed zigzag stitch not so tight and not so hard that when you pull you feel like you're going to pop a blood vessel but once you do that then start to gather those threads and you will see a beautiful sheared result but you can use a gather a, 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 an elastic thread to get that you could even consider putting the elastic thread, ready for this, in a secondary bobbin case where you have looser tension and you actually stitch the elastic thread in, pulling the fabric as you go. Thus, there's tautness of equal amounts once you finish up. There's um, a couple patterns out on the market where you actually shear the fabric before you ever put something together. So the number six foot with a lovely elastic thread is one great way or using the elastic thread in your bobbin case and altering that. A second bobbin case, of course. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. When you want to gather both sides of a narrow panel for inserting into fabric, so say like for a pillow, mm -hmm. do you gather both sides or do you just gather once, I'm thinking, and then sew the gathers on the other side? Well, I kind of showed that one sample. Let me just quickly go back to the, almost the end where the puffing on this right-hand side of the screen. I just used my overlock, set it up with my gathering foot. I sewed down one side, sewed down the other. They were beautifully balanced. Now, a little tip is when you go to attach your side pieces, make those longer than what you need. Make these little side pieces longer than what you need. Now, I kind of like to gather and, and, and attach at the same time, just like what you see up here. But if you did gather first and then placed your flat piece next to that popping strip, 
just give yourself a little more at the ends to adjust and trim off. Don't try to be a perfect match up here. I went longer and I trimmed off and then attached a small piece to kind of finish off that rectangle. But I will do both sides of my puffing strip. And just again, if one side does not look like the other, then you can always adjust ever so slightly, but don't change the settings of the machine you use between sewing one side and the other, so they're both consistent. Okay, great. Well, we had a lot of questions come through, and if we were not able to answer your question, you can send us an email. Also, we will be running this again at 3 p.m. Central Time, so feel free to join us later today. And uh, we also, we will have the recording. Uh, give us a couple days to get the recording up and running. It'll be on Bernina.com. Then select the Learn and Create tab, and then select Webinars, and that should take you to uh, the, this this uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Thank you, Julie. Thank you to everybody out there for your time this morning. I hope I may have shared a little bit of knowledge, and hope we can gather together again for some fun again one day. Yes, yes. Thank you. Hope everyone has a great day. Bye-bye.